and those that have been published don't seem to show any race risk. So why are mobile companies developing and patenting designs for reducing radiation from phones? One suggestion is they're hedging their bets in the face of possible compensation cases against them. Solicitor Tom Jones has 30 cases on his books. I think these patents are very sensible from their economic point of view. They want to be able to protect themselves. The significant thing is that some of these patents, certainly the early ones that I've seen, are referring to the, to the risk to health. And the fact they're even acknowledging that is significant. The phone companies say patenting new designs is nothing unusual. Nokia said it was a natural course of business. Ericsson said patenting was standard practice. Motorola said new designs were not motivated by any concern on Motorola's part about health issues. So far, there's no hard scientific evidence of any serious health issues, but experts agree mobiles haven't been around long enough yet for long-term effects to emerge. Lawrence McGinty, ITN. The debate over the safety of mobile phones. There's more still to come on the ITV Evening News, including speed cameras set to multiply as police cash in. Archer trial hears of cover-up to protect his reputation. And a blow for Rosetsky in the warm-up to Wimbledon. All that when we come back. Remove the life jacket from its container and pull it over your head. Do not inflate whilst inside the aircraft. Playing your arm is a particular favourite of mine, producing a beautiful... Oh! Couldn't afford the flight, dear. There is another way, you know. It worked for me. Welcome back to the ITV Evening News. The headlines so far, the Oklahoma bomber Timothy McVeigh has been executed in America by lethal injection. President Bush said he chose his own fate. And here Michael Portillo is expected to say within 48 hours that he will stand in the Tory leadership race. Kenneth Clark has denied that he's already agreed to back him. Now we've all learned to treat speed cameras with caution whether or not we drive too fast. Well, now they're set to triple in number after a decision that police forces will be able to keep the fines. Bad news for those who break the law. Our consumer affairs correspondent Chris Choi has more details. In prospect for Britain's drivers tonight, more speed traps and more fines. Senior police officers have confirmed a plan to triple their network of cameras. That would mean three million extra fixed penalties a year. Today it was confirmed that within two years, all UK forces will be allowed to keep income from speeding offenders to pay for more cameras. This is a new scheme with the backing of the Treasury that enables us to use the fines paid by offenders to improve road safety. So the offender is now going to pay without distracting police effort from other aspects of police work like fighting crime. Speed cameras already raise millions across Britain. There are 4,500 in the country. Last year they caught a million speeding motorists. That meant £60 million in income from fines. By using cash for cameras, senior officers expect 10,000 more. These things have been breaking some speed records of their own when it comes to making money. They've caught up to 2,000 motorists a day, the equivalent of £5,000 in fines every hour. But so far, only a handful of forces have been allowed to keep that income. Now that's due to change. This speed trap on the M11 is the most active in Britain. Essex police installed it as part of a pilot scheme for the new cash for cameras idea. They say that's helped lower road deaths by 22 a year. But many drivers say it's just another money spinner at their expense. Well, I think if these cameras were about reducing the number of deaths on the road and the number of accidents, we wouldn't be upset. 
But what this is going to do is prosecute drivers who are going just a little bit over the limit, but who nevertheless are driving safely. But in future, like it or not, speeders will not only pay fines, they'll also fund the very cameras that caught them in the first place. Chris Choi, ITN. Lord Archer's former secretary has been telling his trial at the Old Bailey more details about an affair he had with her predecessor. Angela Pepiot told the court he was having the affair at the time he was accused of having sex with the prostitute Monica Coughlin. Ms Pepiot said she'd been part of a cover-up to keep his reputation whiter than white. Harry Smith was in court. On her sixth day in the witness box, Angela Pepiat told the jury of Lord Archer's relationship with another of his former secretaries. She was Andrina Cahoon. Mrs Pepiat said they had pet names for each other. He was Moon and she was Runette. She said Lord Archer once bought two sets of jewellery from the same shop, one for his wife and one for Andrina. Asked what she made of the fact that Lord Archer and his wife Mary had been together throughout the libel trial, Mrs Pepiat said it was to show the outside world that they were a couple, that Geoffrey could not possibly have been involved or have outside marriage liaisons. Asked to describe Lord Archer's relationship with Andrina, she said she was his mistress, his girlfriend. Asked what she thought when she heard the allegation that Lord Archer had been with a prostitute, she said, I could not believe it because of Andrina. I just could not believe it. Earlier, Mrs. Pepiat had an angry exchange with Lord Archer's QC, Nicholas Purnell. He was questioning her about the diary. She says she altered on Lord Archer's instructions in order to provide him with an alibi. Mr. Purnell has already told the jury that Mrs. Pepiat was fiddling her expenses. He said the real reason for her changing the diary was to cover her tracks, to hide her dishonesty. No, not at all, Mr. Purnell, she said. I was asked to alter that diary on Geoffrey Archer's instructions. Tomorrow the trial enters its tenth day with more evidence from Lord Archer's former secretary. Harry Smith, ITN, at the Old Bailey. Police in Dover are investigating the death of a young boy who was shot dead at his home. Armed police were called to a house in the town shortly after midday. A seriously injured woman was also taken to the Kent and Canterbury Hospital where doctors described her condition as critical. Detectives say they're not looking for anyone else in connection with the incident. Eighteen people have been killed after tropical storms hit the southern American states of Louisiana and Texas. Nearly three feet of rain has fallen in a week in some places and 20,000 people have had to leave their homes. Here's Joyce O'Harja. Thousands of homes remain underwater in the wake of tropical storm Allison. Large areas of Texas and Louisiana devastated by the flooding. Rescue workers in Houston have helped more than 15,000 people from their homes and into shelters. They salvaged what they could. This was one of the worst hit areas. 35 inches of rain has fallen here since Tuesday. The water's to here and everything's floating around in the apartment. The death toll had slowly risen. Among the dead, a woman who drowned in a lift that filled with water as it descended into the basement of a high-rise building. The storm has turned major roads into lakes and rivers, leaving behind what's been called a car graveyard. Some drivers were forced to abandon their vehicles. We had to just sit and wait. I put it in park and sat and waited, and as the water came up, it just, I mean, it came up so fast, and we had to just get out and walk. Louisiana, too, has been badly hit by the first storm of the season. The torrential rains caused rivers and creeks to overflow. Residents frantically tried to sandbag their homes as best they could. President George W. Bush has now declared 28 counties disaster areas. And as more rain is forecast, people here are doing their best to stay afloat. Joyce O'Harja, ITN. Football now and West Ham have accepted an £11 million offer for Frank Lampard from their London rivals, Chelsea. The 22-year-old England midfielder has been keen to move on since his father and his uncle, Harry Redknapp, left the club. He'll start talks with Chelsea when he gets back from holiday. A final look now at tonight's main headlines. Timothy McVeigh, the man who killed 168 people when he bombed Oklahoma City, has been executed by lethal injection. The former Tory Chancellor Kenneth Clark has denied that he's already done a deal to back Michael Portillo in the Tory leadership contest in return for a top job in the shadow cabinet. And a man has been sentenced to 16 years in jail for carrying out a blackmail campaign against the supermarket chain Tesco. 
Finally, the summer tennis season resumed service today with the start of the Stella Artois tournament in West London, two weeks before the action moves down the road to Wimbledon. There to ward off a possible player boycott, they changed the seedings process today, which is not good news for all Britain's players, as Felicity Barr reports. With most tournaments now played on clay or hard courts, the Stella Artois is a useful warm-up event for Wimbledon, the only Grand Slam still staged on grass. And it was a threat by some top players to boycott the All England club because of its unique seeding policy that led to a change in the ranking system whereby the number of players seeded doubles from 16 to 32. The introduction of the new system is an example of the growing influence of player power. Over the past few years, several top clay court stars have refused to play Wimbledon, saying the seeding system favours grass court specialists. The All England club hope this compromise will satisfy all the players. Under the new system, the world's top 32 will all be seeded at Grand Slam events, regardless of their abilities on particular surfaces. That's not good news for Britain's Greg Rozeksky. Despite today's victory, he's ranked only 46th in the world, and he'll have to keep winning over the next fortnight to stand any chance of being seeded at Wimbledon. I heard there's this new 32 seeding, I heard, so uh, if I have a good week here, you never know, I could, it could, could sneak in there, which would be nice. It's hoped the new policy will appease players like French Open runner-up Alex Karecha, who isn't a grass court expert. But he still hasn't confirmed his entry to Wimbledon. Felicity Barr, ITN Sport. And that's all from us for now. Trevor McDonald will be back later with the ITV News at 10. And we'll be here again tomorrow at the same time, 6.30. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>